Okay, so good morning, everybody. And this is the first workshop on wildflower identification for butterflies and moths. And um, today we're going to focus upon woodlands. So this is part of a project called Helping Hands for Butterflies, which is a three year project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and Nature Scott. And just in case you haven't heard of us before, Butterfly Contribution are a UK wide charity, which was founded in 1968. And we have a mission to conserve butterflies, moths and our environment. And we do that in several different ways. We undertake practical conservation action to conserve those species. We promote the scientific study of butterflies and moths. We safeguard the important sites. And a large part of my job is around the public enjoyment of butterflies and moths. And just to introduce you to them then, um, so butterflies and moths belong to a group called Lepidoptera, which means scaly wings. Um, and this means then whenever you look at the photograph here, you can see all the little scales on this butterfly's wing, which makes up the patterns. So sometimes if you see them in your home, you might see all that dust coming off them. That's actually the scales coming off of the wings. And this includes butterflies and moths. There's around 180,000 known species worldwide, but in the UK, we have 59 species of butterfly, which are resident or regular migrants here. And we have over two and a half thousand species of moth. And when butterflies feed, they get most of their food from plants. So whenever you see an adult butterfly visiting a flower, they're drinking nectar, which gives them a source of sugar, which gives them energy to fly around. So here's an adult butterfly with his proboscis in the flower, drinking the nectar up. But whenever they're a larvae or a caterpillar, they mostly feed upon leaves or seeds or roots or different parts of plants. And this is when they get the nutrients, which will sustain them for the rest of their lives. But you'll sometimes also see them supplementing the minerals with things like human sweat. If you go to one of those uh, butterfly farms, they might do that. Also, might, they might use animal waste, dead animals. Um, but this one here is called the Purple Emperor. Now, it's found in southern parts of England where it lives at the tops of willow trees. But you can tempt the Purple Emperor to come down so you can see its beautiful colours by putting out horrible buffets of really disgusting foods. And some of the th favorite foods of this is rancid shrimp paste, which purple emperors come down and feed upon. But it's also important that we know about the life cycles of different butterflies. And I'll talk about these throughout different stages in the talk today. One of the nicest ones to know is the orange tip because orange tips are really easy to identify. The males of that species have these orange tips to the wings. So they come out mostly in May and June. Um, and the females and males will mate at that stage. After they mate, then the female will fly around looking for flowers to lay her eggs upon. And mostly in the wild, they'll lay their eggs upon garlic mustard or cuckoo flower. And you can see the eggs just here. Now this species mostly lays its eggs, which are orange in color, um, along the seed pod of that plant. And you can identify them just by looking for them. You can see the little eggs just here. And the caterpillars, they will hatch out in a couple of weeks and they will feed for four to six weeks, mostly upon the developing seeds. And after that stage, when they reach a certain size, they'll crawl off somewhere. So mostly for this species, they'll crawl off and find another plant. So they'll go onto shrubs or fence posts or anything hard like that. They'll form this thorn-like chrysalis and they'll stay in that throughout the entire winter, only coming out, coming out the following year as an adult butterfly, as you can see here. So that's a really simple version of a butterfly life cycle, but not all of them in the UK do that. And I mentioned earlier that we have migratory species and our commonest ones would be painted ladies and red admirals. The one in the photograph is a painted lady. So they, um, the painted ladies have their main breeding grounds in sub-Saharan Africa, and they're there early on in the year, so say January or February. But as the year progresses, they begin to fly north. This is for two reasons. It's to find more caterpillar food plants for their caterpillars, but also to avoid parasitic wasps, which can lay their eggs inside the caterpillars of the species. So over six generations, they go from Africa to Southern Europe and then Northern Europe, and sometimes millions of them make their way to the UK, but it's like a relay race. So no one butterfly does the entire journey and they do it over six generations. So no one butterfly does the entire trip. So that's from tropical Africa, even to the Arctic Circle and back again, a 9,000 mile round trip every year over six generations. So it's a real wonder of the insect kingdom. And in 20, uh, 2009, 11 million of them arrived in the UK and 26 million left. And in 2019, we had another influx of huge numbers of painted ladies coming to our shores. And much of it depends upon the weather in Europe on how many we get coming to the UK. 
But our populations are struggling. So four species of butterfly and over 60 species of moth have become extinct in the UK during the last century. Um, and our latest report on that came out in 2015. found that three quarters of our butterfly species had declined in their range or their abundance over the past 40 years. But some species are expanding, like the orange tip, which I've shown you already. So possibly climate change is helping some species to move into the north. And they're declining mostly because of agricultural intensification. Now, um, it's, it is important that we have enough food to eat and that our people are healthy uh, and such like. However, um, this has come at the cost of much of our wildlife. And when you go through much of the countryside nowadays, you'll see what I call sometimes the green desert. If you look closely, you won't see any wildflowers. You might not see any hedgerows or woodlands or little streams running through it. And this is the main reason why much of our wildlife has declined. But then within our woodlands, there's been a lack of coppicing. So many of our woodlands have become really dark places. They're just too dark for the wildflowers and the butterflies to live in them. But other types of habitat loss are, are included here, such as um, almost half of our broadleaf woodlands. We've lost 200,000 miles of hedgerow. We've lost 95% of our lowland raised bogs, many of our elm and ash trees as well. We've lost 98% of our flower rich meadows, but we're also now looking at climate change and pesticides. So this has been described as death by a thousand cuts because insects are really getting it from many angles. And this is some of the reasons why they're in peril. So butterflies and wildflowers have a really close relationship. And this is because butterflies get most of their food from plants and they've evolved um, specific ways to exploit the plants as best as they can. So I've got some examples here. Uh, you might find butterflies emerge at certain times to coordinate themselves with the plants. Um, a good example is the orange tip. They emerge in spring just as the cuckoo flower and garlic mustard are coming into flower. And as you can see here, they lay them just before the seed pod has developed so that the caterpillars can eat them when they're at the right size. If the butterflies emerge too early, then there would be nothing for them to eat. But if they emerge too late, then the seeds would have been too big for the caterpillars to eat or might have even have dropped. So it's important that the butterflies have evolved to emerge just at the time when these caterpillar plants are at their best. They've also camouflaged, uh, evolved to camouflage themselves against certain plants. And this is a caterpillar of the grayling butterfly. And you can see how well camouflaged it is against the grass that is eating there. So some of them take on that strategy. And this is the northern brown argus caterpillar. And again, you can see it's evolved to be um, green and hairy, just like the green uh, hairy appearance of the leaf that is feeding upon here for its caterpillar food plants. So there are some instances like that. And others have also evolved to actually evolved to actually use the plants in certain ways. This is the six spot burnet moth, and it eats certain plants, which then give it poisons, which it can use in its body to poison predators, which would attack it. And that's why it's so brightly colored. The black and the red appearance of it will tell predators to not even come near it because it could be poisonous. And this is a deterrent for those predators. But then also common ones like the large white, which you might get in your garden feeding upon cabbages or kale or broccoli. They can also use the mustard oils from those plants and it makes them taste really bad, but can also harm the predators too. So they've really evolved to make the best from the plants that they can access. So really you can see that the fate of many butterfly and moth species is very closely linked with our wildflower communities, which is why it's really important that we're talking about this today. Now today I will be talking about um, woodlands generally, but also woodland edges and hedges, because you really could think of hedges as being kind of extensions and even connections between woodlands and many of the same plants you get in hedgerows are also found in woodlands too. Um, and some will be meeting many different plant families and I'll introduce some of those to you just now. So the first plant family I'll introduce you to is the Brassica or Crucifer family. Now, the commonest ones of these that most people will be familiar with are things like cabbage, kale and honesty, which can grow in your gardens. But a good ID tip for this family is that they always, the flowers always have four petals. So it's like a cross and hence the name Crucifer. As you can see here, I've circled one of them. And it's just like a cross with four petals. And that's often a good indicator that it could be something within that family. But they also have leaves, which often smell strongly when they're crushed. And just to be aware, though, there are some other families of plants which have, which have just four petals, including the willow herbs and the poppies. Then there's the daisy family, which is also sometimes known as the Compositae or Asteraceae. Um, and these include some of our commonest plants, including sunflowers, dandelions um, and thistles. So they're a really diverse family as well. 
The thing that they all have in common though is that they have flower heads which are dense clusters of smaller flowers called florets which are packed onto these heads and we can have a closer look at some of those. Um, in some cases though the outer florets look different to the inner florets um, and in other cases though they look similar. So if we just look at the oxide daisy here you can see all those little florets there which are packed full of nectar for insects to feed upon but then you've got the outer florets too which are just um, just modified forms of florets. So that's the daisy family. Then another common one will be the Fabiaceae or the legumes. This uh, includes your peas, clovers and vetches. So um, most well known from your things like garden peas as well as gorse and white clover. They're all members of this family. And the, the flowers in this family aren't regular. So that just means that they're not round. And they usually have the following features. They have um, a standard, which is the big petal at the back. They have wings on either side and they have a keel underneath. So these are the, the three main features of those flowers if you're ever needing to identify them. And then of course, if you find their seed pods, you see that they've got a tough shell, just like a pea, except for the clovers, which have very small flowers. And these are just some examples of them here. So you can see it is quite a diverse family, but they've got overall the same structure within the individual flowers. And the next family is the Lamiaceae or the mint family. Now it does include mint, but includes lots of other plants too, such as thyme or marjoram in your garden and lots of different wildflowers as well. Now, an easy thing to look for these is the fact that the stems are four angled, so they're quite square and the leaves come in pairs. So you can see uh, on this photo from the bugle, which is on the right, you can see just the side, this, um, the side of it there. So that would be four angled. So you can get your, use your hands to see, um, you know, if it has four angles and that's often a good indication. And the leaves being paired means that you have leaves opposite one another. So you've got one leaf there, one directly opposite, and there would be another leaf directly opposite this lower one too. So that just means that they're, they're paired that way. But the flowers themselves um, are, have a certain structure with a hood at the top and a lower lip, as you can see here. They don't make big seed pods like the legumes and the seeds are kept quite close inside the flower. So other ones we'll be meeting, um, I'll not talk too much about the families themselves, but just so you know, not everything will fall into those families I've discussed so far. So we'll start with the brassica zen. So the garlic mustard is one of the most important plants for the white butterfly species. Um, you can find it in woodlands, but also hedgerows and other places with more light, which are close to trees. When we're trying to identify the garlic mustard, what you look for are the nettle-like leaves. And, and this is sometimes the first sign before you see the flowers. So the leaves, leaves themselves do look like nettles, but they're on quite a, an upright stalk. So, they're, so they do grow much taller than nettles do. And they have clusters of small white flowers on long stalks, as you can see from both uh, from the photograph on the left. They have a long stalk with little white flowers at the end in a cluster like this. Um, and they also, if you crush the leaves, they smell of garlic, which is how it gets its name. So this plant is not related to normal garlic at all, it just happens to be that the leaves do smell of garlic, so just be, bear that in mind. But as I mentioned, it's one of the most important caterpillar food plant for various species, including orange tips, green vein white, small white, um, and less so for the large white butterfly. Um, and as you can see, this is a male orange tip feeding from the flowers there, but the females will come and they'll lay their eggs upon the seed pods around the top. So that's garlic mustard. But we'll just jump over to a completely different garlic right now, which is the actual wild garlic, which is within the lily family. Um, some people also know this as ramsons. And when you're looking to identify this plant, what you're looking for are the broad leaves and many flowers. So you can see, see here really broad leaves like this with clusters of white flowers at the top. Nothing else really looks like that. However, there are some similar species, such as the few flower garlic, which is thin leaves, which is the easiest way to separate those species because the other types of garlic do have white flowers too. So just to repeat, it's got broad leaves with white flowers here. And if you crush the leaves, you'll see that they're heavily scented of garlic. And this is one of the plants which people can forage. So you can go around picking some of the leaves and taking not too many of them. And some people make pestos or salads from them. And you can find them even in deep, sh deep shade within woodlands and they flower in early spring. Now staying with the lily family then, we're on to the bluebells. Now this is what we sometimes call the English bluebell, which is our native bluebell to the UK. Um, now if you're looking for this one, it has drooping stems. So you can see all these flowers here are kind of drooped over at the side. 
and all the flowers are on one side of the stalk and with petals that curve back at the ends. And you can see it really well in this photograph here. The petals do curve, definitely going backwards, just like this. Now there's also the Spanish bluebell, which is an introduced species. And unfortunately, the Spanish bluebell can hybridize with our native bluebell. So you can get ones which look halfway between a normal Spanish bluebell and an English bluebell. So it's not always easy as we would like. Normally, though, they're more upright, as you can see in the flowers here, so they're not curved over like the English bluebell. Um, the flowers are on all sides of the plant, so not just on one side, and sometimes they are different colours. You can get them in white or even pink, um, kind of a pinky mauve colour. So, um, and also the, the flowers themselves are saucer shaped, so the, the petals themselves don't actually curve backwards like they do on our native bluebell. So just so you're aware that those both exist. And now over to stinging nettles, and I'm in, uh, I think most people know stinging nettles and don't need to be told twice what they're like. However, I just want to remind people that they are an important food source for many butterfly species, um, including the small tortoiseshell, comma, peacock and red admiral. Um, and the caterpillars of these are not camouflaged at all. Often they're really large and black with spikes upon them, and that can be hopefully to deter predators from eating them. So just so you're aware that the, the stinging nettles are a, a woodland plant. You can find them along woodland edges and they're still important for, for butterflies. But we also have plants which we call dead nettles, which are not related to stinging nettles at all. The reason they get their name is because they don't sting. Um, however, the, the leaves often look like nettles. So just so you're aware that these are around. Um, now white dead nettles should be flowering soon in many places. So it flowers early on in the year, February or March. Um, they're really stout plants, so they're quite strong with really strong stems. And they're found in the lighter parts of woodlands um, and hedges. But they've got the, really the most distinctive thing about them is that they've got these really large white flowers. And these are very important for queen bumblebees coming out early on in the year, especially common carter bees and um, garden bumblebees, which have long tongues and can get inside to them. Um, and just so you're aware, these are part of the Lamiaceae family, which are the mints. And in the next one, you can actually see the square stem. This is the red dead nettle. Um, and as you can see here, it's got this rib going along the stem. And if you felt that, you would see that it is a square shape. Um, so these are shorter plants though, with um, weaker stems, you'll see them scrambling across the ground. You'll see them in woodlands and woodland edges, but you might also get them in the garden um, and consider them as a weed. Um, but they do need a bit more light, so they're often found at the edges of woodlands because they can't really cope with the darker shade. Um, and really, when you're trying to identify that, um, there's nothing else like it because it's um, it's got these uh, pinkish purple leaves at the top with these pink flowers too. Uh, so we're staying with a family now with the Lamiaceae, um, and this includes hedge woundwort, which by its name will tell you that it's often found in hedges and woodlands as well. Um, and now with this species, um, it's quite distinctive. It's not really like those other ones at all. It grows probably to about 30 or 40 centimetres tall. Um, you'll find it around hedges and woodlands, but it's got these deep purple flowers, just like this, with often white patterns upon it, which almost look like orchid flowers, but they're not related to orchids at all. Similar to the other species I've mentioned, it has these nettle-like leaves, but again, it can't sting. So these flower much later in the year, uh, around July or August, but you should also note that the lower leaves have stalks upon them, as you can just about see in this one here. This will help you to separate it from the similar marsh woundwort, which has no stalks on the leaves. So um, just to be aware that that's the case. So the, the most similar plant to this would be marsh woundwort, but they're often found in different habitats and look slightly different as well. Now, one of the most important plants for nectar for uh, butterflies early on in the year is called bugle. You might also see it called a juga, which is its Latin name. And when you're looking for that plant, what you want to see are very short spikes of blue flowers with purple or greenish leaves. So start off with the flowers. There's nothing really else like this with this pale blue on these spikes. Um, and the spikes don't grow very tall at all, maybe 10 to 15 centimeters from the ground. And you can also notice the purpley green leaves as well, which really uh, makes it quite a distinctive plant once you know what it looks like. So the flower early on in spring, but they can be found in a variety of different habitats. It likes a bit of shade, um, so this includes woodland and hedges, but also damp grassland where it can actually be sheltered by things like bracken or taller plants later on in the year. So just to be aware that you might just find it in different habitats too. 
but it's also one of the most vital um, sources of spring nectar for some of our rarest butterflies, including um, some of the fertility butterflies, which I'll talk about later. So uh, it's a really good garden plant too. So you can buy it in garden centers and grow it, um, grow it anywhere in a garden with a bit of shade. Now we're onto a different family now, onto the primroses, another important nectar source early on in the year. So I think many people know what the primrose looks like generally, but what you need to do to separate it from other species, um, especially some of the cultivated garden types, is to look for a single yellow flower on each stalk. As you can see in the photograph here, you can see a stalk with a single flower at the end. Uh, you'll find them in woodland glades, hedges and old grassland. So similar to bugle, you will find it in open grassland if there's a bit of shade for it from taller plants later on in the year. And they flower mostly from April to May. And its close cousin then is the cowslip. Um, and these used to be quite rare in Scotland. However, they're being used more now in seed mixes for road verges. So they're beginning to pop up in more places. Um, it is much less common than the primrose though. And really the way you can tell them apart is the fact that it has several flowers at the end of the stalk. And also the yellow is a much deeper color, much darker yellow compared to the pale yellow of the normal primrose. So that's primroses and cowslips together there. Um, other yellow flowers, um, we're over to the buttercup family now. Um, and the first one I'll include is the lesser celandine. Um, so with this one, you've actually got seven to 12 shiny yellow petals. And the shininess of those petals is very similar to what you find on a buttercup, just to remind you that it's in that same family. You've also got dark green, glossy um, heart-shaped leaves, which grow very close to the ground like this. And sometimes you see a single one, but more often you'll see a whole carpet of them just carpeting a woodland like this. And it does flower very early on in the year, so probably early March into April for uh, in many places. So it's a really good um, source of food for the first insects which emerge every year. Uh, again, staying with the buttercup family is the winter aconite. Um, and this species um, isn't native to the UK, but it's naturalized now. So it's been introduced many centuries ago and has found its way into many woodlands. And so you might think of it as being a native wildflower, but just remember that it has been introduced. It's similar to the lesser salandine, but has fewer petals, only six, but it's got this leafy fringe going around the top of the flower, which is very distinctive. And as you'll notice, lesser salandine doesn't have that feature, but they flower around the same time. Um, and staying with the buttercup family, but a uh, plant which looks nothing like a buttercup is the wood anemone. Um, so this is a really good indicator of ancient woodland because it only grows six feet every hundred years through the spread of its roots. So if you find a huge mass of this, you know that you're in a very old woodland which hasn't been touched for a long time. So it's, it's a really nice plant to see. So the flowers have five to eight white petals. Sometimes they're pink underneath, especially when they first emerge. They bloom from March until April, and they usually found in the open parts of woodlands or hedges. So, um, you know, around glades and rides where they get a bit more light, so it won't be found in the deepest, darkest parts of woods. However, sometimes you will see it in, um, in open grassland, and it might be an indicator then that that place was once covered in trees. And it's a kind of a sad and poignant reminder of the trees that used to be there. And these are the wildflowers which are remaining um, beyond the time of the trees. Just another plant with wood in its name, which isn't uh, which isn't in the buttercup family either though. This one is wood sorrel, uh, another good indicator of ancient woodlands. But it, um, what you're looking for with this species is a shamrock-like leaf. So it's a really perfect shamrock, just like this. Three petals with a kind of a dent in the middle of each one of them. Um, so it's got the shamrock-like leaf with these white flowers, which do have um, like pink veins growing along them. So you can identify those with that feature. These flower from April to May and the leaves are edible so they actually taste like a lemon or apple peel um, and so if you if you feel comfortable to do that and you feel certain that it is wood sorrel just have a wee taste of them and you really need to bite them to release the flavour. Um, but also remember that the wood sorrel has the name sorrel but it's not related at all to the common sorrel or to the sheep's sorrel. We'll meet those in another lesson. The word sorrel itself is just derived from an old French word, sorel, meaning sour, as all of those plants taste bitter. So this is uh, an unfortunate thing about uh, common names sometimes. They can mislead you some ways, but in other ways they can give you an indicator of what the plant is like or where it might be found. Another really nice woodland flower, which is really important for butterflies, especially the caterpillars of them, is the common dog violet. 
So it's very easily identified by the single blue flowers on each stem, just like this, um, with a typical violet shape. Now you find these in woodlands and hedgerows, but you might also again find them in grassland if there's some shade from things like bracken. So bracken's a tall kind of fern, which will grow on open hillsides, but in a way that those can act like a woodland for little plants like this, because whenever they grow up, they will give shade to these um, smaller woodland plants and it allows them to be found in different places. There are some, uh, some very similar uh, other violet species, but common dog violet is by far the most widespread and common of those. So if you see a violet, there's a very good chance that it's just the common dog violet. Um, other ones we'll meet, which I'll tell you how to identify at the time, are the marsh violet and the mountain pansy. But one of the things to remember with common dog violet is that it's got these heart-shaped leaves like this. Now, just to stay with common dog violet, I mentioned that it's a caterpillar food plant for several butterflies. And these are some of our rarest and most uh, our top priority species, including the pearl bordered, small pearl bordered and dark green fritillaries, which are really beautiful butterflies, which all lay their eggs upon dog violet. So um, it's a great plant if you're out on, a, on an open hillside in May and you see any dog violets, do keep your eye out for any of these butterflies because they could be there. The dark green fertility though does fly later in the year, so it's out around July or August time. Um, and just let's have a closer look at one of those species. We've got the pearl border fertility here, um, a really stunning species when you see them up close. They've got these bright orange upper surfaces to the wings, but the undersurface is how it gets its name because it looks like a, a, a pearl bordered along the side of the wing like this. It's a really beautiful butterfly to find. And as you can see, it's nectaring upon bugle here, which I mentioned earlier is a really important uh, nectar plant for them. But they're a top priority for conservation for us because they've declined by 95% across the UK since the 1940s. Now Scotland though does, does still have the strongholds of, of the species. Um, and as you can see here, it's quite widely distributed, but you'll only find it in certain habitats. And those are places with dog violet in sunny spots. So it really needs um, sunlight. Um, these butterflies do like the warmth. Plenty of violets and lots of nectar plants, especially bugle and primrose. These might be surrounded by woodlands, um, which can shelter the grassland and let them really warm up to increase the temperature. Um, you'll also see them associated with bracken, and that's because the caterpillars will crawl onto dead bracken, which can be up to 20 degrees Celsius higher in temperature than the surrounding grassland. So after the caterpillars have eaten, they'll crawl onto the bracken and by warming up, it helps them to digest their food. So we find that we can manage places um, with bracken to encourage uh, this, this beautiful little butterfly. Um, so on to a different, uh, few different types of plants now, we're on to the, some types of geraniums, which um, include the wood cranesbill. So it's not strictly a woodland plant though, you can find it in meadows and riverbanks, but they have really large flowers up to two centimeters across, um, which are kind of purpley blue color with pale centers. And you're looking for these ragged leaves as well. But a much smaller plant, which is in, still in the geranium family, is called Herb Robert. And you might have seen it in your garden and regarded as a weed. Um, now, the Herb Robert sometimes has white or pink flowers, just like in the photograph here. Um, you can find it in various shaded habitats um, with really small flowers, only up to one centimetre across. Um, and the, the leaves themselves are pale green and fern-like, often with red tips. And you can see the little fern-like leaves here, just like this. And you'll see them scrambling across ground on hard reddish stems. So if you look at the stems, you'll see that they're quite um, quite red, but the flowers themselves, um, the, the outer, outer cases of the flowers are deep red as well with these white hairs upon them. Um, then the foxglove, I think many people can know and recognize the foxglove. These are mostly found on, again in woodland edges. You're looking for the tall spikes of purple or pink flowers with or, or white flowers too, with dark speckles in them. Um, and often you see them wherever woodland has been cut. So it might have been a really dark woodland for years, but then the following year after the woodland has been cut or thinned out, you'll see the foxgloves coming up in huge profusion because they've got the sunlight on their seeds and it might be the first time ever they've ever had a chance to grow. So you can see them in large numbers sometimes. Um, they're not really important for butterflies at all, but they're much more important for longer tongued bumblebees. Uh, now the plants in this family are both, they look quite different, but they, um, they're in the same family. So this is red campion, first of all. Some of you might be familiar with this just um, from being out in the countryside, 
but it has these pink flowers, which actually look like 10 petals, but they're only five, but they've all been divided. So you can see here, um, as you can see around the flower itself, it looks like 10 petals, but they're each divided almost to the center. So it, it's actually five, but looks like 10. And the leaves for this plant are, are, are paired, but they're also quite hairy. So for me, it's quite a distinctive plant. It's an easy one to remember. Um, and it's, it's a good one to look out for because butterflies and moths really love the nectar that they can get from this plant because the nectar is contained quite deep within it. So other, other insects can't access it except the longer tongued butterflies and moths. Then you've got greater stitchwort, which doesn't really look a lot like red campion. However, if you look closely, it's got these five petals, which are also really divided too, similar to the red campion, really divided almost to the base, just like this. And you'll find this kind of just scrambling around in hedges mostly. Um, and it's, a, it's another really good, important uh, nectar plant for butterflies and moths. And to honeysuckle. So um, these are very distinctive and it's really hard to confuse honeysuckle with anything else. It's a climbing plant with large creamy colored flowers um, and they start off pink, but they can change color as well. Really heavily scented. So they make most of their scent in the evening though, to attract those night flying moths to them. And they flower from mostly from June until September. Um, you might also, if you don't see them scrambling over plants, you'll also see them just crawling across um, forest floors until they get some light and then they grow up towards that. But the caterpillars, um, of the 20 plume moth, which is a really beautiful moth, um, are um, they feed upon the flowers of honeysuckle. So um, the 20 plume, you might see that almost at any time of year because it has several generations per year, but it's got these almost like plumes going along each wing like this. Now, um, I think it's important that we all learn a few grasses. Grasses can be difficult, but I think if we all recognize a few, it gets much easier over time. One of the most important for, again, for some species of butterflies um, is coxfoot, which is a really vigorous, tall growing grass. Um, it gets its name because the flowers, which are all contained at the on these tall stems, do look like the kind of uh, a chicken's foot. You know, it looks like a toe of a chicken or, or something like that, which is how it gets its name. It can grow up to 140 centimetres with these really dense masses of florets, and you find it in many different habitats. And then Yorkshire Fog grows tall as well, but not as tall as Hawksfoot. And um, the flowers um, have a soft purple appearance at first, but as they get older, they, they begin to fade in color and look more like this. But the leaves are very soft, so it's a really easy one to identify by the leaf because the leaves flop over, they're really soft, covered in fine, soft hairs. And like Hawksfoot, you'll find it in many different habitats. But the reason I featured both of these grasses is because they're the caterpillar food plants for some of our most widespread brown butterflies, including the speckled wood and the ringlet. So speckled wood, like its name would suggest, is always associated with woodlands. You'll find it along hedges and woodland glades, and it's got mostly a brown appearance with these creamy speckles on the upper surface. Then the ringlet um, is another one associated with the kind of woodland edges and glades. Um, it's, it can cope with darker habitats than other brown butterflies, so you'll often see them around these habitats. Um, and both of these species will lay their eggs upon Coxfoot and Yorkshire Fog, as well as a few other vigorous grasses. So how are woodlands doing? Uh, the British Isles were once covered, almost entirely covered with forests, um, you know, many centuries and e even millennia ago. But most of these forests are now, um, are now not there anymore. Most of them were deciduous with pine woods in the more northern parts. And here you can see a photograph of um, the remnant of our great Caledonian pine wood, which would have covered much of northern Scotland and, and parts of southern, um, even southern parts as well. Um, so those pine trees dominate mostly in drier habitats. But most of our woodlands have been cleared for agriculture, building and other, other reasons. So um, in the early 1900s, it was estimated that only 5% of the UK remained covered in woodland. That number is now 13%, but unfortunately about half of that um, is actually non-native um, Sitka spruce plantations, which are grown for wood and for, for pulp and things like that, but they're not, those trees aren't native to this country. So we are increasing the amount of woodland cover, but a lot of that isn't even good for wildlife, unfortunately. In Scotland, um, we have the most woodland in the UK, but again, about half of that is non-native pine tree plantations. So just bear that in mind when you read numbers like this. 
hedgerows aren't doing so great either. Um, so following World War II, the government policy actually encouraged hedgerow removal to make uh, food production more efficient. Um, but in later decades, hedges were sometimes just abandoned. So they became poorly managed and just became gappy trees, really, because um, hedges are essentially woodlands which are kept under control by, by annual cutting. However, more recently, there's been more incentives to plant and to manage hedges. So hopefully that number is going to increase. Um, and this is really important because hedgerows help wildlife to move throughout the countryside. They really are great at connecting up different habitats and woodlands, for example. Um, when butterfly conservation is managing these places, um, we really need want to encourage sunlight. So we can do that in a number of different ways, but just bringing sunlight into places will encourage more wildflowers and more butterflies. But we still want to maintain the woodland around those two. So that might be through the opening of new glades. So glades like this, you can see the woodland's been cut here, the trees all around, which might seem counterintuitive because in a time when we're trying to plant more trees, we're cutting them down. But that's not always the case. So sometimes we're just taking the wood, we're stacking it, we're leaving it there, we're not burning it, um, and we're leaving it the area for the wildflowers to flourish again. Then in other um, heavily planted, really densely planted woodlands, it's really important that these are thinned out to open up rides and glades for the wildflowers to flourish. And that can involve coppicing of certain types of trees too. And all that can result in more wildflowers coming back but also then the butterflies that depend upon them. And some of our most significant species, um, which are our top priority species, which have benefited from woodland man management, have included the wood white and Duke of Burgundy and the pearl border fritillary. Now the wood white and Duke of Burgundy aren't found in Scotland, but they're some of the most, um, the species which really depend upon good woodland management and the ones which have benefited from um, us working with other partners to encourage habitat for those. Now, if you want to find out more about what we're doing for woodlands and how you can get involved as well, you can visit uh, this page on our website. It's butterfly-conservation.org forward slash our work. Um, and if you go to that page, um, you'll see um, all the work we're doing, um, including habitat management, and you can look at our reserves. And if you're looking at habitat management, you can see how to manage woodland and, and scrub and what we're doing to help the butterflies and moths find in those places. So thank you all for listening and I'm happy now to take some questions and answers.